If your church has been around long enough, they've probably got one of these hanging on their wall somewhere. It's a painting of a shepherd and a sheep. Well, lots of sheep. Uh, beautiful green pastures, still waters. It's quiet, it's peaceful, it, it's all of that. But have you ever tried to steer a sheep? All right, time for dinner. Come back, no, it's okay. You guys, wait, we're friends. Why do you run? Hey, don't get smart out with me, all right? All right, someone's getting the shears. And if I'm to be honest, sheep, they're dumb. I don't know if you've heard, no, they're just not as smart as other animals. No, they're dumb. Like walk off a cliff just because it's there, dumb. All right, do you want me to take you out to pasture? Because I will take you out to pasture. No, no, come back. Karen, no, Karen, over here, over here. Goodness gracious, they're just stubborn. Skittish, too. Fearful little things. Oh, don't be like that. Do you want me to get the shepherd's hook? Do you want me to get the shepherd's hook? Hey, hey, I'm the one that feeds you. Hey, don't ignore me. I think I get kids ministry now. Fine. I love you. You ever wondered why Jesus called us a sheep? Kind of a bitter pill to swallow, huh? If we were to closely examine our lives, look at all the messes that we make, how fearful we are, how fickle and wayward we can, well, if I can just put it bluntly, how dumb we can be, we are sheep. Yeah, sheep, that's about right. <laughs> but thankfully, God sent us a good shepherd, someone who will be gentle with us when we are far from home, someone who will be firm when he needs to be. Doesn't it say everything that God picked shepherds to send the good news of Jesus' birth and that right there should remind us of his shepherd in ways right off the bat. That first Christmas, it was a sign of peace with God for all eternity. And our shepherd, he paid the price for that peace, the highest price. I don't know about you, but this Christmas, it means so much to me that I have a good shepherd.
here for you this morning. Jesus, the one and only. This is why we gather. This is why we live. Because you loved us, now we can love you. May we grow closer to you each and every day so that when we say, my heart will only sing Jesus, that we can mean that when we sing that. Sing that one more time. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus. Lift it up to him this morning between you and him. My heart will sing no other name. Dismiss kids at this time so you can learn more about Jesus. Everyone else, turn to someone and greet them this morning. Good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. Boy, I hope you feel it more than you sound like it. My word. Merry Christmas. 
Let's get in the spirit. We, above all people, have a reason to be merry during this season, don't we? Our God reigns. If you're visiting with us uh, this morning, it's especially nice having you here. And uh, you can check in at KCC by using that QR code. It's also uh, at the top of that weekly update that you received when you came through the door this morning. So you can just click on that with your uh, phone camera and uh, check in, and we would appreciate that. Also, if you are a parent, you need to know that next Saturday we are having our kids' Christmas party. It's important that you come as a family because there's going to be family activities but also part of that uh, event the kids are going to practice because next Sunday our kids are going to help lead us in worship and they're going to need to practice just a little bit next Saturday so please parents make it a priority to be here for the kids Christmas party well this morning we have a special guest with you uh, but before I introduce her would you watch this video The way home was outcropping, I think, really of scripture. God gave us James 127, which is religion that God the Father accepts as true and faultless as this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to not be polluted by the world. And we thought, what if we could find poor, widowed women who are raising their own grandchildren and secure their homes and secure these families in a better way that they could stay together. We bring the message of the gospel. I think the most important thing is for them to know that Jesus cares. And the best way for them to know that is to know that the resources for us to help them physically to build a house comes from many Christians who have themselves believed and they're shocked that someone who doesn't even know them would give and provide that they might have a home. We explain the gospel and teach them how to study the Bible and how to fellowship with one another. We, they meet in granny groups and our pastors teach them just who he is and how he loves them. We provide them teaching in Farming God's Way, which is a biblical worldview, application of agriculture, but we intertwine God's word into that. What we try to do is to let them know that God loves them so much that he's even coming now to help them in their plight, that they can know Jesus and they can say, I believe in him, he loves me, and I want to follow him. Would you give a warm KCC welcome to Marsha Ball? <laughs> Marsha is the director of this Ugandan ministry called The Way Home. And uh, Marsha, tell us a little bit. I, I know that your husband already did on video, but uh, would you tell us in a nutshell what The Way Home is all about? As that video said, The Way Home is all about sharing the gospel with these widowed grandmothers that are raising their orphan grandchildren um, in the country of Uganda, which you guys have s so faithfully supported this ministry for so many years, and we are so appreciative of it and so glad to be back here with you. I came today with my two of my sons, Joseph from Uganda and Samson, my 16-year-old, um, used to be grandson, now is a son. But the whole focus of The Way Home is to send these grannies and their children to Jesus. And that is The Way Home. We're <coughs> not a home building ministry, but um, when we find these grannies and they're, they're sent to us through their local village churches from their pastors who know that they're destitute and they, have, they don't know where their next meal is coming from, they have rain coming through their roof. They're sleeping on mud floors. Sometimes they don't have um, ev even that. Sometimes they're just in a lean-to shed with a metal thing hanging over their, over their roof or over their whatever structure they put together, whether it's sticks or... And they, they um, are not going to survive. So we, when we find them in that condition, we interview them, we find out, um, what their family situation is and we understand that they have land that we can build a house on and so we kind of stop the bleeding in their lives so that um, so that they can have a firm foundation and then we teach them 
through all of our training programs, Good. through vocational school and through Farming God's Way so to survive. So as, 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 as I understand it, AIDS has ravaged the continent of Africa Absolutely. and Uganda has not been spared. Yep. So a lot of children find themselves orphaned, mom and dad yep. have succumbed to AIDS and their grandmothers yep. who are already destitute yep. uh, are bringing their children in. And that's, that's the right. ministry that you find your niche in is ministering to those grannies who now are raising their own, are raising their orphan grandchildren because yes. their own children have passed away. That's right. Wow. So how did this ministry get started? <laughs> you know, when you say yes to God, you never know where he might take you. <laughs> so we said yes to God, my husband and I, we were married at um, age, we met at age 15 in high school. We were married at age 19 and a half. Um, and if God had told me that when we got married at 19 and a half, that we were gonna live in Africa for 10 years. We were going to have six children. Two of them would be um, adopted grandchildren, and one of them would be from Uganda, along with our three biological kids. And we would have a ministry to widows and orphans, and I would be widowed, um, running in a widowed or an orphan ministry. I think I would have been fit out from the belly of a whale on a beach someplace, truly. But um, that's what he did in our life. And uh, he ran us through the lab experiment of raising your orphan grandchildren in, um, in your 50s. And, now you and, and your, we could relate. You and your husband are from Kalamazoo. From your husband Kalamazoo. was an attorney yep. here in Kalamazoo, yes. and then God just plucked you out of Kalamazoo and put you over in Uganda, he right? He sent to us there to ministry. teach the Bible. That's yeah. what that's what was the the hook that he yeah. got us with was to teach. We we taught um, Bible study fellowship here in Kalamazoo, and we got a call asking us if we would consider moving to Africa to teach the Bible in Bible study fellowship. And that's where it all started. And about what year was that? That was 2000, the 2000. year 2000, okay. so, so 22, 22 years down 22 the road. Years. So you mentioned the fact that you're a widow. We saw your husband up that's on the husband. Uh, screen uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, he got COVID. You actually yep. both got COVID at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Lord allowed- he took him all the way home. Took him all <laughs> the way home, right? Yeah. yeah. So now you're left. Uh, carrying the responsibility and having the burden of running yep. this ministry, a joyful burden. It right? is a joyful burden. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit now that Russ uh, is in heaven uh, and you're carrying this uh, responsibility, tell us a little bit about where you see the ministry going in its next phase. Russ and I led this ministry as co-directors for the 12, 12 years that we did. Um, and he was a business attorney before he was, before we went to the mission field in 2000. He had a, an amazing mind for forecasting businesses. And he did that with The Way Home. He set up, before he was gone, he set up an amazing um, agriculture. We, we worked <coughs> through different, different, um, prod, different crops to see what was gonna work. And we ended up with eucalyptus trees and he said, he figured up a business plan for if we had 70 acres of eucalyptus trees that um, in five to six years that that would sustain that ministry in Uganda, run by Ugandans, and that was our goal. So is that your next phase? So that's the next is phase. To that's what we're in right now, work working toward that. So you've got property, you're planting the trees, and so you're still building homes, still ministering to yep. grannies, but in working to be self-sufficient financially, Yes. This is a project that y'all have taken. We want on. that gospel to continue past our our living days. Awesome. Whatever days God has for us, we're working toward that goal. And that is so motivating, even though my husband's gone, to carry on that goal of um, achieving sustainability in Uganda so that the gospel will continue. Be, yep. I'm going to ask you to pray in just a second, so be prepared for that. Uh, you were given a brochure when you came in, it's actually a flyer. And here's what uh, we've decided to do this year, is over the next 
couple of weeks. It says now through the 18th, but we're going to extend that to Christmas. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be receiving funds for this particular ministry in Africa. I just have to say this. If you were to look at your church family update and look at our finances, they're, they're tight. In fact, we're struggling in some areas uh, as well. And so you might think, well, if the church here is struggling, why would we take on something more in Africa? Uh, because we think it's important to do so. We think that these uh, widows and these orphans, um, well, financially, we'll just, we'll just have to make it work in order to bless them this season. So we're asking you to give a special gift over and above what you normally give. And would you please mark it Africa, the way home, the way home Africa. Just make sure that on your check, on your online giving, in the memo portion, or you can attach a note with your gift. If you, uh, you know, do it hard copy, just say, please give this gift to way home Africa. And uh, we'll make sure that it gets to Marsha and her team. So here's what I'm going to do, uh, Marsha. I'm going to ask you to pray this way. Would you pray for us mm -hmm. as we pray for you? Because we want our heart to be broken um, by the things that break God's heart. And I think it breaks his heart, uh, what's going on in Uganda. And uh, would you, you pray that our hearts will be aligned with his? Thank you. Thanks. Dear Jesus, thank you um, that you have connected me with this family. Thank you that family is your focus in this world. And thank you that um, you've opened our eyes to the needs of families all over this world and all over the other half of the world. It's not um, coincidental, Lord. We know this, this morning and this project is not coincidental. So I ask you to work in the hearts of the ones that you are calling to be connected to this project in, in, a, in a way that um, causes them to understand and their hearts to be broken for what breaks your heart. God, widows and orphans are um, one of the top uh, people groups that in your word that you ask us to take care of. And so we ask that you would um, make that real in the hearts of these people sitting here and that that would give them great joy this Christmas to um, make a difference in the world for a whole family across the world that um, is looking to you for their survival. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny and Marcia. Um, to me, that is one of the, as we've talked about before, that is one of the great signs that God is moving is when somebody is willing to pick up and move out to f fulfill what God has called them to. And they did that years ago, and they've been faithfully serving uh, the Lord in that for years. And so we want to get behind that. So I appreciate that. Um, I forgot my uh, lighter. This is... One of those traditions that maybe some of you had when you were kids, I know we did, we had an Advent wreath on our table, and so every meal we would sit down and my parents would light one or two candles, one and then two and then three and then four, as you got through Advent, and the first candle that we lit last week symbolized hope, and we talked about that last week, and by the way, if you weren't here for that, I encourage you to go back and listen because it's an important one. Um, it's an important one to start that way. The second one that we're going to talk about today talks about peace, obviously. Peace is the theme for the day. And peace is one of those things that, you know, it's, we tend to think, oh, yeah, I have peace. I don't, I'm not in, in abject conflict, so therefore I must have peace. But the reality is if you look deeper, you realize that many of us don't have peace and that the peace that God wants us to experience is much deeper and much more all-encompassing than most of us tend to think about. So, you know, at Christmas time, we, we tend to think of these big themes, joy, love, hope, and, of course, peace. But peace in our world seems pretty elusive. Uh, again, when you're looking anywhere deeper than just the surface level, real peace seems difficult to find. 
Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow the, wrote the poem that one of the songs that we already sang was taken from, but maybe you don't know his background. I like Christmas music, and so I like to find out the background. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was, many considered him the greatest American poet. He lived in the years of the Civil War, and in 1861, he had the second major blow in his life, and that was that his second wife died. His first wife had died like 20 years prior to that, uh, of a, of a quick-moving disease and fever. Uh, his second wife died a tragic death in that her dress caught on fire. Of course, they used candles to light everything then. Her dress caught on fire, and he tried to save her with a rug or a blanket, and then himself, and he got severely burned, but her burns were so bad she died within two days. And so this was his wife of 20 years, the love of his life, and it just you know, just took a toll on him. Well, the Civil War was, of course, going on, and his oldest son, against his wishes, went and enlisted in the Union Army. And in November of 1863, he was severely injured, and so he had to come home to Dad's home and heal up. And so here he's dealing with the, the death of his wife, he's dealing with the severe injury of his son, and he's looking at the Civil War around, and he's, going, and he's hearing the bells of Christmas Day. And he's going, something doesn't measure up. These two things don't match up. What is wrong? And he, so he wrote this song. And so when you hear the words, it makes a lot more sense when you understand that. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so when you understand his situation... He's, I mean, it's, he's in a struggle. He's trying to figure out where is peace. I don't see it out there. I don't feel it in here. And yet I hear the bells ringing and the songs are being sung. So somehow there's, there's got to be something missing. Where's the disconnect here? And that's the same world we are kind of in today. Peace in our world today seems elusive. Granted, we don't have a, a civil war. We long for peace in our world. But even without the civil war, violence, division animosity, friction, offense, hypersensitivity, all of these things are rampant in our, in our world today. Violence in the inner city is up and it's spilling into other parts of the, of the nation. Division has busted its way into most of our families to the point where you know, we're, we're, we have friction within families. Some families, it, it has become almost the norm for families not to get along together and people to avoid each other even around holiday times, so that a healthy family who loves each other and wants to hang out together is a, an exception rather than a rule. It's not uncommon for siblings and, and their families to refuse to talk to each other for years or to be in the same room as one another because of some offense that was years ago. In addition to all this, when we start to look at within ourselves, peace within seems certainly very elusive also. Peace in my own mind, a peace in my own heart, and that becomes increasingly difficult to achieve. Many people today are confused about their lives. They're confused about their identities. They're confused about where they should go, what they should do. Do they have a purpose? Do they have meaning? Do they matter? And many people feel like, well, I don't matter. This world would be better off without me, some say. And of course, as a result, they are depressed and filled with anxiety. And that is the reality. So there's not peace out there, and there's not peace in here. And we hear the bells, and we hear the songs, and we see the decorations. We wonder, how do these things match up? These things, conflict and anxiety, are prevalent outside the church, but they're also prevalent inside the church. We are not immune to these things just because we have faith. 
They don't magically go away as soon as we come to Christ. The problem, though, is that once you're in this mindset of offense and sensitivity and anxiety and depression and a lack of purpose and uh, getting used to conflict, once you're in that mindset, it becomes more and more difficult to work yourself out of it. And it has become really a, a major uh, thing to bear that you don't, know, you don't know if there's any choice to get out of that. And so you hear about Christmas and you want, it to, you want to believe that the stories of Christmas can change us, but you have to admit that, man, I don't know, I'm pretty deep into this hole. It can seem pretty impossible. And so I think it's safe to say that our world is, in these ways, in a mess. And so what does Christmas have to say to the mess? How can Christmas break through all of that noise, all of that friction, all of that anxiety, and do anything for us? Can it? Well, the the key is that you can't just think of it in terms of Christmas. Christmas as a event has no power. It's just another event. It's just another thing to put on your calendar with a whole bunch of stuff to go through and a whole bunch of things to fit into your calendar. It can become more stressful than anything else if you look at it as an event. It's important to note that if we're, experiencing, if we're going to experience peace at all, it doesn't start with a what, an event. It starts with a who. It starts with Jesus. It starts with God. If we can have peace with God, then God will enable us to have peace in these other ways as well. But it has to start there. And for much of our culture, they're looking at the event of Christmas and they're missing the person of Christ. And we can't afford to do that. And so every year, even though you hear the same stories... Even though you sing the same songs, it's important that you and I as believers focus back on what does this really mean in my life? And who is he that I'm celebrating? Because if you don't do that, you're going to miss it just like everybody else. You're not, again, you're not immune to it. It starts with a who, not a what. It starts with the Lord. If we are going to have peace with God, it needs to start there. It's a big reason. That's the main reason for Christmas. That's the main reason for the events we celebrate at Christmas. Remember the scripture that we talked about last week, one of the scriptures, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Why? Because he has the wisdom to show you how to live. He has the wisdom to live life the way it's meant to be lived. And if you are open to his wisdom, he will counsel you. He will be called Mighty God in the fact that he has the power to do everything he is, that is necessary to do. He can move mountains. He can intervene in your situation. He can even make you a peaceful person when all around you are not. The everlasting Father, he will be with you everywhere, all the time. You will never escape his gaze, his love, his ability to reach you. And the Prince of Peace, the only one who can give real peace. Peace that isn't just circumstantial peace. When you have a nice moment and it's snowing lightly outside and the Christmas decorations are on and you've got Christmas music, that's a nice peaceful moment. That's a circumstantial peace. And at any moment it could change. The snow could turn into an icy mess and there could be an accident that changes everything immediately. So if you're looking at circumstantial peace, you're going to be, it, it's, going to, it's not going to last. You need something more. You need what the scriptures talked about and the Old Testament writers talked about when they talked about the concept of shalom. Say shalom. shalom. Shalom is much more than just the absence of conflict. Shalom is a whole embracing of peace upon, in every way. It's the embracing of, of flourishing, of a blessed life, of the way it's supposed to be, its fulfillment, its well-being across, across all areas of life. And that's why when Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full, that's the kind of thing he's talking about, is shalom. He's talking about you experiencing the joy, the peace, the contentment. The awareness that you're walking with God and he's working in you. That's what it's after. Cornelius Plantinga in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, says this. He says, the Old Testament prophets dreamed of a new age in which human crookedness would be straightened out. The rough places would be made plain. The foolish would be made wise and the wise 
humble. They dreamed of a time when deserts would flower, when the mountains would run with wine, when weeping would cease, when people would come and sleep with weapon, without weapons on their laps. They, they would work with, in peace and work to a fruitful effect. Lambs would lie down with lions. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans would be knit together in a brotherhood and sisterhood, and all nature and humans would look to God, walk with God, lean toward God, and delight in God. Shouts of joy and recognition would well up from the valleys and the seas, from women and from men. The webbing together, he says, of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. That is what the Hebrew prophets meant when they said shalom. That's the idea. This is not just merely not fighting. This is much, much more. And this is what God wants for you. Every single one of you. And you out there. And all of your friends and family. He wants it for everyone he created. And of course, most of us are not experiencing it. So, when Isaiah prophesied a child would be born to us in Isaiah chapter 9, hundreds of years later, the Jews were still looking for it. The people of Israel were still looking for that Messiah. And the Messiah was the Prince of Peace that they were looking for. He had been promised centuries before, seven centuries before, and now he comes at a certain time. He is the Prince of Peace and the one and the only one who can bring you that peace. And so for, if you have family and friends who don't believe, they're trying to get peace from their circumstances. They're trying to get peace from some other philosophy. The reality is they're just not going to do it. It's just not going to work because they need the Prince of Peace, the one who could come and bring them peace, the peace that God designed us to have, designed for you and I to experience is from God. It comes through the Prince of Peace. It comes through Jesus, that Christ child. And centuries later, we read about his arrival. In Luke chapter 2, we read about it. Let me just read it for you, and you can just listen. But write it down if you want. Maybe if you've never read the Christmas story before personally, if you've never, never read it as a family, <clears throat> read it this week. Get it out at the dinner table. Read Luke chapter 2. It's a pretty powerful story. Let me just read for you. Luke chapter 2, I'm just reading verses 1 through 20. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor in Syria. And all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from a village in Nazareth, of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared them, and the glory of the, Lord, of the radiance of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and on earth peace to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to a village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby, wrapped in, snug, in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child, and all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. If you look in that whole passage and you look for one key to peace, there is verse 14 that I think is the key. Verse 14 says... Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth peace to those who, with whom God is pleased. So according to the angels, this fulfillment, this birth of this infant would be the fulfillment of the promise and he would bring peace from God to all who would believe, all who would say yes. 
This was the long-awaited Prince of Peace that they had been waiting for since Isaiah penned it seven centuries before this. And finally, the promised one came, and he would bring peace to the people. How? Well, the angel said it. It's peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So the question becomes, okay, how do we know if God is pleased with us? How can we get to the point where we are pleasing to God and we can therefore experience peace on earth? I think there's three ways that you need to experience peace this Christmas and three ways that God wants you to experience peace this Christmas. First one is peace with God. That has to be foundational. It has to be foundational. If you don't have peace with God, then the Prince of Peace can't possibly do much more for you. There will be a surface level where your belief is there. Maybe your religion is there. And it will bring you some degree of peace. You'll have peace when you come and you hear nice songs and you see good decorations and things of that nature. That'll be nice. But that's not the peace that he's talking about. That's not shalom. He's talking about much more than that. And it has to start with peace peace with God. God created us. He knows us. He knows how our lives are supposed to work. He knows the best way for us to live the best life we can possibly live. He wants us. It's not like he's holding out on us. He wants us to seek his lordship, his authority, his leadership, so that he can live, he can help us to live that life. And if peace is what we're after, it has to start here. Because here's the problem. You and I are estranged from God. Our relationship with God is on the rocks, if it's up to us. Our relationship with God is strained because we're looking at self first more than anything else. We're not looking at Him. We're not looking to worship or follow Him. We're looking to worship and follow ourselves. That's sort of our natural bent. And unless something changes that, that's going to continue. And maybe we'll bring in religion because it makes us feel better, but it's not going to change us. That has to change at a core level. And that's why, so that baby who came, came with a reason in mind. He came in order to repair that relationship with God. He came in order to make it possible. And why did he do it? He came to conquer sin and death and the grave so that we could have peace with God. Because he came as the baby in the manger and then he grew And he lived the perfect life, and he explained who God was, and he taught all about God. And then, even though he didn't deserve it, he went to the cross and paid willingly a sacrificial, brutal death to pay for our sin. And then he rose again from the grave, and now he lives in us. And that is how we can have peace with God, as Paul writes in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to have peace with God. You can try all the good religious stuff you want from now until forever, and you won't get it unless you embrace faith in Jesus Christ and you let what he did account for your sins. When you see the word therefore, you always ask, what is it therefore? You ask, what, okay, what is this linking up to? When you see the word therefore in Romans 5, 1, you've got to look back at Romans 4. And Romans 4 talks all about you can't be justified by obeying the law. You can't be justified by good works. You can't be justified by religion. You're justified freely by the grace of God as shown in Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ. That is how you get peace with God. As we sang, God and sinners reconciled. This is what it is. It's the new birth that he, we sang about as well. That Hark the Herald Angels Sing has a lot of truth to it. You should go back and take that song apart a little bit more. And that is how we know that we are those with whom God is pleased because of faith in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And that's the only way. Unless we have peace with God, the other kinds of peace will be difficult, will be elusive, will be short-lived at best. But if we can have peace with God through Jesus, and if he begins now to work within us and to change us and to make us more like Jesus, then we can start to apply that peace to other areas of our life and start to feel it and experience it. I I read this week about Christmas in Afghanistan. Now, granted, our troops aren't in Afghanistan anymore. This was a couple years ago. But a guy named Lee Bishop, who was a psychiatrist and military reservist, was stationed in Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan on Christmas Eve one year. And in the dim light of dusk, he watched a procession of military vehicles approach the airfield, came to a stop, and carefully unloaded a flag-draped steel casket. He knew that somewhere in the U.S., a family was going to suffer a Christmas homecoming that no one wanted. 
it was a heartbreaking scene for him to take in. But then, a little bit later, he wrote, After watching the casket unloaded from the military vehicle, I find myself walking along the main avenue of Bar Bar Bagram Airfield, and all is different. Soldiers are, handing candles, or are holding candles and belting out Christmas carols with gusto. Down the street, luminaries brighten the walkway into the clamshell-shaped auditorium where cheerful groups of uniformed men and women go for a Christmas concert. And two blocks away, the chapel is filling for the 6 o'clock evening service. He said, Jesus didn't come just to provide an occasion to sing carols and to drink toasts and to feast and exchange gifts. But we are right to do these things even as soldiers die and families mourn because he came. And in his coming, he brought peace. Peace and joy. Joy that overcomes our sorrows and the only kind of peace that ultimately will matter. It's the peace with which will end all wars, terrible as they are, and, just, and the end of wars is just one small token of that peace. It's a peace that means the long war between the heart and its maker is over. It's the peace treaty offered in Bethlehem and signed in blood at Calvary. He concludes, So joy to the world and to everyone celebrating or grieving every hurting soul in it. The Lord has come. Let heaven and nature and even those who stand watch with lighted candles in the land of the shadow of death, let them sing. Peace comes to us. It starts with peace with God. But it doesn't stop there. It, the second way you, God wants you to experience peace this Christmas is peace within. Peace within is sometimes more elusive than peace with other people because we know our secret thoughts. We know our struggles. And when, we are bed, or when our, our head hits the pillow at night, they're still with us. And they might keep us awake at night, right? We can never get away from those things because they're in our minds. They're in our hearts. They're in our lives. According to data from the National Institute of Mental Health, 38% of girls, teen girls, and 26% of boys have an anxiety disorder. On college campuses, anxiety is running well ahead of depression as the most common mental health concern according to a survey of 150,000 college students. But it's not just students. It's not just young people. It's older people like me as well. It's people of all different ages, especially in our culture, and it seems to be getting worse, not better, despite all our technological advancements and everything. Anxiety is taking over. And what does the Scripture say to that? Well, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is one verse that you, you hear repeated a lot. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that sounds really good. It really does. I want it. Everybody wants it. But I've talked to a lot of people who said, man, Pastor Dave, I've prayed. I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. And I don't sense that peace of God. It doesn't take it away. It doesn't take the problems away. It doesn't take the situation away. But you have to understand this is not like a rabbit's foot prayer where you just say it and everything goes away. It's not magic. It certainly isn't magic. It won't automatically take away whatever you were anxious about. But I think this is more of an invitation. This is an invitation to trust God with your situation. This is an invitation to acknowledge that God, the God who created you, who loves you, who knows you, who sent his son to die for you, that God knows your situation. And that God can handle your situation. And so when you pray, if all you do is pray, it will not change your situation. But if you pray and trust, and you keep reaffirming your trust in God, who knows what he's doing, who knows your life, who knows how to bring about the good in your life, and loves you more than you can possibly imagine, then when the situation comes to your mind again, you can say, no, I've trusted this to God. Lord, I reaffirm my trust in you. I know you're going to work. I know you're going to do what you need to do. I can trust you, and therefore I can relax, and I can rest in your hands. It's remember, we've talked many times about Romans 12, 1 and 2, about the peace of, or the, that you will be, don't be conformed in, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And when you know that, when you know God's will for you is good and pleasing and perfect, you don't have to resist it. You don't have to help God out. You trust God. 
And, and you know, okay, I brought my situation to you. It might be a situation I had nothing, I, I, it happened to me. It might not have been something that I brought about, even if I did bring it about. And it's my own fault. I know that I can trust you with it, Lord, because you are good and you are loving and you are wise and you are kind and you are merciful and you are all those things. And as a result, every time it comes into my mind, I'm going to bring it back to you, not to say, Lord, remove it, but Lord, I trust you. Lord, I'm going to rest in your hands. That's the place I need to be. So help me to be in your hands more consciously. Help me to be in your peace more consciously because I trust you. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, excuse me, back up. I'm going to back up. I missed, that was my fault, Brian. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives do not let your heart, heart be troubled and do not be afraid. The world gives peace that is circumstantial, flippant. It, it goes and comes like the breeze. Jesus gives you peace that stays, peace that can change you. Jesus wants his followers to have peace and he gives it fully to those when we let him work in us. So when we choose to trust God and when we choose to rest in his hands, even when it comes back to mind, we reaffirm our trust, then we can have peace. And so it might be about finances. It might be about relationships. It might be about your health, whatever. Lord, I'm bringing it back to you again in trust and in faith. I rest because you have it. I know you do. Help me to believe it. And then the third kind of peace that God wants you to have this Christmas is peace with others. As I said at the outset, we all know that peace with others is I mean, it's, it's difficult to find nowadays. Conflict rages all over the place, even in our relationships, even in our trusted relationships, family relationships, conflict rages. Many times in our ho holiday gatherings, in our families, we're just hoping that Uncle so-and-so won't light the fuse by saying that thing that blew up Thanksgiving last year. We're hoping that somebody will keep just nice, right? Because we don't want it to blow up again. And there's been division over the last few years, and oh, we just want a nice Christmas. Is that too much to ask? And so we want peace with others. Division and conflict are nothing new. Of course, they've been around since humans were created. But the Prince of Peace can bring people together. He can actually bring people together who don't want to be together. He can actually bring people together and heal relationships that don't want to be healed. He can bring us together and grow us out of our prejudices, out of our offenses, out of our hurt feelings, out of our poor attitudes. He can bring all of that together and work in us so that we can enjoy peace with one another. And if you and I have peace with him and peace within, we are much more likely to be able to experience the peace with others. And that is when Matthew 5, 9 comes in. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called children of God. So here's a question. If you consider yourself a child of God, let me just like ask you for real, are you a peacemaker? Or are you one who gets offended all the time and holds a grudge? Are you one who talks to other people rather than the person that you have a problem with? Because if you can talk to all of them, they'll get in your corner and then maybe you'll never have to talk to that person. Are you a peacemaker or are you a peace taker? Are you a peacemaker or are you a peace faker? That's what a lot of us in the church are. Oh yeah, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything, nobody say anything, everything's fine. That's not peace. Are you a peacemaker? That's what the Lord wants you to do. As a child of God, you and I are called to live in peace. Remember, the, the idea of peace is shalom. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's the presence of every good fruit that God wants you to have. The fruit of the Spirit is obviously in Galatians chapter 5, a whole list of things that God wants you to experience and wants you to not just keep it to yourself, but now to share it with other people. So as we let him work within us, we are able to work out our relationships and our difficulties. Romans 12 says it this way, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all. Do not become, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He's talking to you, church. He's talking to me as a person who says I'm a child of God. He wants you and I, as his children, to be peacemakers. So this Christmas, are you making peace with people? Or are, you are you excusing bitterness? Are you excusing unforgiveness? Are you excusing grumpiness? <laughs> are you excusing arguments? 
Are you making room in your life for things that God doesn't want you to make room in your life for? Are you being a peacemaker? That's what he wants you to be. And God will give you the strength to do it and the wisdom to do it if you have peace with him and then if you have peace within. And that's where it comes from. Apply the thing I call the Meyer test. And here's what I mean by that. If I go to Meyer, and by the way, I go to Meyer virtually every single day, and I see all of you in Meyer, right? I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'll see you at church, you know? And then I see somebody here, and it's like, hey, it's not Meyer. Great, good to see you. But anyway, if you go to Meyer, and you see somebody in the aisle down the, the way, do you, do you duck into another aisle? I mean, in real, right? Do you do that? Because I don't want to, oh, I don't want to see that person. I don't want to put up with that person. Honestly, it shows up a lot. And people over the years, I've been here 23 years, people have left the church. And when I see them out in public, and I call it the Meyer test, but it might not be Meyer, am I willing, am I able to greet them and to be genuine about greeting them? And I've got to say there have been a couple people over the 23 years that I've ducked into the aisle and I've thought, "Uh uh-oh, that's a good sign that there's a problem. But most of the people, the vast majority of the people, by the grace of God, when I see them, no, no, whether it's some of you or people who have been here before or people in my life, by the grace of God, I don't duck. I want to see them, and I greet them, and I try to greet them honestly and genuinely and that kind of a thing. And that's the thing. If you are finding a whole bunch of Meyer tests where you're failing, there's a problem. And you can blame other people, but the problem starts with you. And the problem is that God wants you to be a peacemaker, and he wants to work through you. See, the truth is our world is aching for peace. It shows up in our politics, our family gatherings, our thought life. So at Christmas time, we are reminded more than any other time of our need for peace. And it's the peace that only God can give. It's the peace of the Prince of Peace. And so I would say if you're not experiencing that, that's where it needs to start. Where are you at with Jesus, the Christ child? If you're not experiencing that today, maybe it's because you don't have a relationship with him. Maybe it's because you've just sort of You have a relationship with him, but you've sort of walled off a bunch of parts of your life from him. So I'm going to give you just a few seconds. I want you to think about this. Talk to him as a few minutes of silence. Do you have peace with him? Start there. You know, the Holy Spirit will show you. Do you have peace within? Is there something you're not giving God authority over or control over or you don't trust him for this? And do you have peace with others? Do you fail the Meyer test too often? And then we'll pray. So just think about that. Ask God to show you. Father, we thank you that you have sent Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to this world. And even though it happened 2,000 years ago, because he is alive, he is still changing our lives. We thank you that you've sent him for us so that we can have a relationship with you. We know also that as we allow you to work in our lives, you can, we can have peace within. And Lord, we know that you don't want it to start, stop with us. You want it to flow through us to other people. And so I pray, Lord, for each person here, that if there is an area, one or more areas in their lives where they're not experiencing the peace, the shalom, the blessing you want for them, that they would know it. And they would repent of whatever it needs to be repented of. And they would lean on you in a new and deeper way so that they could experience your peace. A very practical, real, tangible peace this Christmas. Lord, help us not to just go through these motions. To just, you know, have a nice warm Christmas feeling and then be over it. But help us to really let the Christ of Christmas, the Jesus of Christmas, the baby of Christmas, the Prince of Peace, fill us and change us. Lord, if there's a person we need to have a conversation with, I pray that you'd give us the courage and the wisdom to do it. If there's a person we need to forgive, help us to do that as well. And if we need to come to know you, Lord, show us that by your grace. Help us to celebrate Christmas in a new and deeper way this year than ever before because of your peace. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, have a Merry Christmas week. We'll see you next time. Thanks. You're dismissed.